favorite pianist? And that's a hard one to answer. You can name a couple. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Well, this Friday night I'm hearing Yafim Bronfman mm -hmm. uh, playing it with the La Jolla Music Society, and I've heard him before, and he's actually practiced at San Diego State uh, uh -huh. um, because he's a very good friend of one of my former grad students. Uh, I'm looking forward to his uh, program. I think uh, some of his concerto playing is, is some that I love the most, his Bartok concertos. And, and uh, this weekend he's doing all sonatas, or this Friday he's doing the Haydn and Coco Trip, and so I'm looking forward to this program. Um, then uh, I know that it's very controversial, but um, I, I actually enjoy hearing long one play. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of people get very distracted by his <laughs> movement, but uh, I've heard him play um, both with orchestra and solo programs, and I've enjoyed his programs. I, I, I find him to be a very thoughtful musician. Um, certainly, there's so many. Murray Pariah is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have many of his recordings and uh, have enjoyed listening uh, to him live on several occasions and with orchestra, but uh, also then he has recorded. Uh, then we could go back, of course, I love Horowitz and, <laughs> and uh, got to hear him one time <laughs> here in San Diego, amazingly. Wow. Okay. He, did, he took a break, of course, when yeah. I was a grad student and about the time he decided to come back, uh, I think I may have been writing my dissertation and uh, couldn't afford to go stand in line for three days to get a ticket out in yep. the red in New York City. So <laughs> I did get to hear him in New York. Uh -huh. But, and then I, you know, so I, many, uh, many uh, favorite uh, pianists. And uh, I'm trying to think, uh, who I'd say my favorite female is, but I can't uh, offhand several are coming to mind, but uh -huh. uh, I was hoping to hear um, Martha Gerich in Rome when I was recently uh -huh, in yeah. Rome, but got sick that night, so I didn't get to go home. Oh. <laughs> <So>, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is it possible for you to pick maybe just a few of the pianists you talk about and maybe some specific specifics about why you like each of their playing. Maybe just a couple of them. Um, the ones that I'm most drawn to, um, and, and I have season tickets to the LA Phil, and so I've yeah. also enjoyed hearing several pianists, for instance, I just heard Yuji Wong mm -hmm. play with the Israeli Philharmonic in, in LA. Uh, the thing that um, I think I'm most drawn to is uh, the beauty of the line. Uh, yeah. It's it's how that that particular pianist chooses to shape and project the line. And going back to our discussion on rubato, it's mm -hmm. it's that those pianists seem to have. A, a God-given gift to just be able to find the right band, perfect timing in uh -huh. so many things. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it's dynamic. It's 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 the dynamic of the playing. I'm taking over and over again, and it makes me think back to my young students how important it is to bring that dynamic playing in immediately. Mm -hmm because it has to be ingrained from the very first times we're playing a lesson uh, or a piece on a lesson that we feel the difference in the, the dynamic structure. Um, the, I, another thing that often takes me by all of these pianists is um, you come away knowing exactly what they intended you to hear. Um, so most of the ones I've mentioned, I heard Murray Pariah in, in um, L.A. most recently, and he played Bach, um, and you, you, after hearing the Bach uh, English Suite uh, in E major, he, you, you knew exactly what he wanted you to hear. 
So it's a decision making yeah. that I think I'm most impressed by too, is that you hear a conviction mm -hmm. about what it is that they believe the music is saying and they are able to present that to you. <laughs> Something to I remember. <laughs> okay. Um, you have a favorite CD? Oh no, I listen to so many. Things. I don't <laughs> know if I have a, a favorite. Um, because I'm in a hearer, um, Eugene Brockman, I've been listening to some of his solo uh, for Pope Sonatas okay. uh, recently. But oftentimes it's not that I have one that I listen to extensively, but um, oftentimes it's the music that my, my students are playing. And, and then I'm usually listening to more than one uh, performer's uh, recording of that piece. Okay. So it, it, oftentimes I'm listening to a variety of repertoire and a variety of, of artists as opposed to putting one favorite thing on. Okay. Uh, certainly one of the things I have in my car is, and I heard him just play uh, also at the La Jolla Music Society, uh, Tip of Day. Okay. Uh, yeah. in, in his jazz things. Really? I love his jazz things. Okay. I've heard him do Bill Evans, I have his Bill Evans recording and uh -huh. um, it's wonderful. Okay. He does that very well as, as well as his classical repertoire. Okay. His program at La Jolla was, was uh, all Debussy. Okay. But, which he, of course, I have all these recordings of Debussy, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I also enjoy listening to him play some of the, the jazz pieces. Okay. Uh, okay, let me see if I can, what about, um, say you were looking, uh, listening, like your students have a certain repertoire they're playing. Are there certain pianists where you would say they have the definitive recording, or they have they're they're the best at a certain composer. Where if you know your show, your students may be playing Chopin, you'd be like, okay, I'll listen to this pianist play, and because you know they're kind of known for being, um, you know, I that plays that composer that well. that repertoire. Sure. Uh, although I will try to give them a, a breadth. You know, with YouTube now, yeah, we we really do have at our fingertips. And so oftentimes my computer is right beside me at, at the pianos. Um, and so for instance, um, I have a student playing one of the Chopin Nocturnes who's a ninth grader. Okay. And um, she is struggling a little bit with her rubato. And so we went on to YouTube. And um, I, I will tend with my students to recommend certain ones uh, of the old guard that are no longer with us, be it a Horowitz or an Aral. Okay. Um, but then I will try to also find some of the younger, newer artists that I, I like. Um, so it depends what's available, but on YouTube, then sometimes um, I will share one of my, the CDs in my library with okay. them as well to take home and listen to. Uh, so I can, I sometimes will mm -hmm. recommend, but I usually like to have an older artist that's okay. no longer performing or living. And then I like to have, uh, usually my students listen to somebody that they can go to. Okay. So um, actually um, that's quite typical what I would recommend. But uh, I do take into account if they were known, if a, a particular performer was known for uh, a, a particular composer or like a Gisa King with Debussy, okay. um, you know, that, that is, you know, I might recommend that and certainly have. Mm -hmm. But then I do to the day too, you yeah. know, with his newer recordings of, of the, the Debussy. Okay. What about Bach? Who do you have a person that you think you haven't listened to for Bach? Well, again, I will have them do a variety, um, mm -hmm. but I like um, Angela Chang very okay. much. Um, okay. And um, then uh, I find hers, her Bach wonderful. 
I will have uh, Andre Schiff, who I'm, yeah. I'm missing, who's playing all of Bach in, in this year and next up in Los Angeles, and oh, of course yeah. he's recorded it all. Yeah. There can be times that he, he does improvise, and so for a younger student to, to all of a sudden hear a slight variation can be a little bit confusing. Um, and then, of course, for the opposite, uh, Glenn Gould, okay. just, but usually I will approach that with the fact that oftentimes he, he was a concert artist who was very successful playing this, but he was playing Gould. <laughs> and my students are not Glenn Gould. And so that oftentimes he's either doing a tempo much faster or much slower mm -hmm. than what we traditionally hear. Yeah. What about, let's say if you have a student who's playing Beethoven sonatas, and you could only recommend one set of recording for Beethoven sonatas, whose would you recommend for them to go get? Well, that's a toss. <laughs> um, I like Richard Good. Okay. And I also have all of the Brendels. Okay. Um, a little bit different approach. You know, Brendel can be pretty strict. Uh, so I would probably, it would be one of, the, one of those two. Although, again, <laughs> you know, it's hard because I also have Murray Karai playing a lot of Beethoven. Uh -huh, yeah. And um, it, it, so many people have done the Beethoven. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes I might be choosing a piece because I like how that particular recording of that piece okay. is done by that artist. But yeah. in general, I would probably be going towards a Brendel or a good. Okay. Um, so I think you mentioned listening to Horowitz in concert. Um, do you have any most memorable live concerts that you attended? Well, that was a memorable one. Okay. Uh, that was down here in downtown uh, San Diego at the City Theater. Mm -hmm. um, at that point in time, all of the classical concerts were in the city theater. Um, and um, I, you know, was new and you know, I couldn't afford to sit in the very, very front orchestra, but I did splurge and, and sat um, towards the back of the orchestra in, in uh, one of the lower terraces. And I think what impressed me most was a going back to the great artists um, that Horowitz could play the softest song and you could still hear it speaking <laughs> with such beautiful tone uh -huh. that it, you know it was it was a sin and that that how his song could speak. And the other thing that impressed me about his playing was uh, live, I mean the live performance, was that one note to another note was perfectly matched or shaped. Uh -huh. that, that there was never a note out of proportion. I, I was just terribly taken by his ability to shape the line, yeah. and that, that there wasn't anything out of the ordinary. I mean, it, it was out of the ordinary, <laughs> and that it was so phenomenally shaped, yeah. and that dynamically he could move between two notes like no one else ever could. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that Dr. Chu, my, my undergrad at Castle Long Beach, I'm not, I might be misquoting him, but I know he always says that that Horowitz is known to have like what six to eight different levels of just pianissimo or something like that. And um, and he says, oh, of course he he had his own piano wherever he went, so he, you know he controlled it very well. And but you know that just amazed me. Like how do you have eight different levels of one dynamic? Yeah, it was. It, it, is, <laughs> it was remarkable. And, and, and you know, I don't know what the number is, <laughs> yeah. but I can tell you that the, the pianissimos were were definitely pianissimo. But the issue was is that that note didn't disappear. He was able to still get that note to speak. 
to somebody at, way at the back of the hall. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was remarkable. It really was. So maybe that would be one of the most uh, memorable performances that occurred. I mean, I've heard many very good ones. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm constantly come home and from wonderful concerts and say, oh, I want to find more time to practice. <laughs> uh, it's, it's uh, yeah. you know, it's inspiring. You know, to to hear what people, what great artists can do with the instrument. Okay, that's a good way to lead into um, what would you what what is it? What would you say is some important reasons why children or pianists or parents should be taking their kids to concerts for? What's some reasons why they should do that? Well, um, first of all, for the mere being exposed to that environment. Um, it's, it's constantly, uh, um, you know, to hear classical music performed and because we don't get that opportunity very often. And uh, so I know a lot of teachers actually give their students trophy points or whatever if they attend so many uh -huh. programs. Um, I don't set up those kinds of conditions for my students, but I certainly encourage, in fact, this coming Friday, my, one of my high school seniors is going to the Yuffie Brockman's concert with me. Oh. You know, I usually try to take some of my seniors uh, to a few programs uh, so that they get that experience and we can discuss it as it, it's occurring and in the intermission. But it is certainly to be exposed and to see what it's like to perform uh, a 90 minute, uh, you know, time period of totally memorized music. Yeah. And then to be able to hear uh, the difference in dynamics and what the beauty of that is. Um, and, and just to be exposed to the repertoire. I think it's important for students to hear all sorts of, whether it's even hearing each other play, mm -hmm. but then, you know, certainly I always try to get students, and sometimes I was successful younger students to come in here, college students perform, yeah. so that they're seeing this uh, constant evolution of skills and abilities uh, that, is, uh, that are important. But the whole family should see the discipline of what, it's, it, what it takes to be a fine artist, uh, whether, and that's again, whether you're a pianist or a violinist or um, even a dramatic artist, uh, the types of preparation and, and the skill that it takes to be expressive of what you do. Well, thank you. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up our okay. interview. I learned a lot, um, a lot, so I'll be re-watching these and taking notes when I get home. Okay, uh, sounds so good. I just want to thank you, Dr. Collard, for doing this interview. You're most welcome. It's good to see you again. <laughs>